On this Monday night, concerns about patient confidentiality. Complaints the University of Toronto collected thousands of medical records without consent. Of course we value research, but it can't be at the risk of privacy. A Global News exclusive. The hero in an horrific massacre. I realized I needed to get the weapon away from him. The young man who confronted the gunman in Monterey Park, California. New controversy over how the Arrive Can app was developed. Highly illogical and uh, inefficient. And she is a putt above the rest. How Canadian golfing champ Brooke Henderson has sliced her way into history. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with allegations of a data breach involving the privacy of medical records in Ontario. A group of doctors has filed a complaint about a massive data project they believe broke provincial privacy laws and violated patient trust. The doctors who have shared their complaint with Global News alleged the research project at the University of Toronto collected and shared over 600,000 electronic medical records without the consent or knowledge of patients. Privacy experts say the case centers on finding a balance between better public health data and protecting patients' rights. Karen Lieberman has our top story tonight. Most people expect when you visit your doctor that your personal health information is kept confidential. Medical data is so sensitive. Global News has learned Ontario's Privacy Commissioner is investigating a complaint filed by a group of Toronto area doctors that alleges more than 600,000 electronic medical records have been collected without patient consent. Patients were not afforded any real opportunity to withdraw. They were completely unaware. The doctors allege the University of Toronto Practice-Based Research Network, or Utopian, has collected medical records from 1,400 family physicians in a massive data grab that violates privacy laws. There must be some ability to identify people from the de-identified data. Otherwise, why would they care? So they're saying, look, of course we value research, but it can't be at the risk of privacy. Patient credit card information is also allegedly being collected. The data is sent to Utopian servers where it is de-identified, stripped of some direct identifiers like names, and according to the complaint, sold to researchers, an allegation denied by the University of Toronto. For personal health information, if all that's being removed are very direct identifiers, to me that's not anonymized health data. Privacy and health experts say the complaint highlights a growing debate about balancing the need for better public health data with protecting patients' privacy rights. We need big data. Um, when I say big data, I mean we need large healthcare data sets. We all know that. We really learned it powerfully in the pandemic. But you know what? Most Canadians are okay with that, but they need to know what is going on. Utopian now feeds into an even larger data sharing project with other participating universities and has collected 1.8 million electronic medical records. That could become a prime target for ransomware attacks, says this cybersecurity expert. Our healthcare networks, as well as our research environments, are mainline targets for many of our adversaries, including China and Russia. Utopian declined an interview with Global News. After we sent a list of questions, which went unanswered, its website was updated, indicating it was pausing any collection, use or transfer of data. The university did tell us by email that it is working with the privacy commissioner to address the concerns in the complaint, adding that patient data is stored on servers at a high security facility only accessed by authorized personnel. Donna? Karen Lieberman in Toronto, thank you. Alberta is farming out more surgeries to private clinics to help relieve patient backlogs. A clinic called Canadian Surgery Solutions will receive public funding to perform 3,000 hip and knee replacement surgeries for patients within Alberta's health system. It's not a first for the province, and while the government says the move is necessary to reduce wait times, critics worry the outsourcing of surgery to private clinics will ultimately cost everyone more. Heather Urex west explains. The painful wait for hip or knee surgery can take years. Thousands of Canadians are caught in surgical backlogs, particularly for elective orthopedic surgeries. The waits have existed within Canada's health system at the best of times, but they've been made much worse by COVID-19. The wait times are far too long and we have to get them down. 
To do that, Alberta is looking at private surgical facilities, contracting 3,000 hip and knee replacement procedures from Canadian Surgical Solutions. Those surgeries are in addition to surgeries done in hospitals. This contract will increase total orthopedic surgeries in Calgary by 21%. The procedures remain publicly funded, patients don't pay out of pocket, and they won't jump the queue. It's also not new to Alberta. Last spring, the government boosted its number of private contracts for cataract surgeries. Since then, it says the wait list has been nearly cut in half. This is going to be safe. Uh, it's going to be regulated. Alberta's announcement comes less than a week after Ontario unveiled a similar plan, with a focus first on contracting out thousands of cataract surgeries before expanding to hip and knee procedures as well. But critics say the privatization plan is flawed. Private companies exist to make a profit, and every healthcare dollar that goes to companies' profit margin is a dollar that is taken out of the public system. Instead, Alberta's NDP says the government should focus on expanding the province's public health system. With tens of thousands of patients waiting right across the country, one thing is clear, something needs to be done. Additionally, Albertans were left waiting after a network outage took down a number of the province's computer systems, including NetCare and ConnectCare, systems that hospitals rely on to treat patients. Emergency services was also impacted, though 911 services remained functional. A number of elective surgeries, however, did have to be cancelled. Donna? All right, Heather Yurks West in Calgary, thank you. In Newfoundland and Labrador, the government wants to end a strike by private ambulance workers. It has proposed new legislation that would make ambulances essential. Premier Andrew Fury called an emergency debate today. If passed, the legislation would ensure services continue in the event of a strike or lockout. About 100 workers are on strike right now over wages and pensions, and much of the island of Newfoundland is served by private ambulances. Healthcare is on the minds of millions of Canadians as a federal cabinet retreat begins in Ontario. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his ministers are gathering for three days to set the priorities ahead of Parliament's return next week. Long wait times for medical care, plus rising interest rates, the cost of living and a potential recession are all hot topics. Turia Isri is in Hamilton where the retreat is taking place. Turia. Donna, the ministers are back from the holidays and laying out their priorities for the next session of Parliament. And chief among them will be Canada's struggling health care system. That will likely dominate the conversation over the next three days. Great to be in Hamilton. Lots of work to do. Thank you. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau repeated that he is optimistic the federal government will reach a deal with the provinces. Uh, I know Canadians need uh, us to come together to solve uh, health care uh, for the medium and long term, and that's exactly what we're working on with uh, with Canadian with uh, with premiers right now. We're going to continue to work collaboratively on the things that Canadians expect us to do. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev was less optimistic a deal is imminent. Trudeau has delivered nothing on health care for eight years. Our health care is worse than ever after a nearly a decade of Trudeau. Why? Because he spent all of his time fighting with the premiers. The other big issue on the table this week is the rising cost of living. Inflation is slowing down and unemployment remains low, but another interest rate hike is likely on the horizon. The Bank of Canada is expected to announce its eighth hike in a row on Wednesday, with most forecasting an increase of a quarter percentage point. The ministers say they're here to come up with a plan on how to make life more affordable, and they're hoping it resonates across the country and especially here in Hamilton. This is traditionally an NDP stronghold, but the Liberals made gains in the last election. This retreat will set the roadmap for the return to Parliament. It will also offer clues for what we can expect in the budget, which will likely be tabled in the spring. Donna? Turia Isrian, Hamilton, Ontario. The Prime Minister had some blunt words about how the federal Arrive Can app was created. The Globe and Mail first reported an Ottawa IT firm, which the government hired to build the app for $44 million, actually subcontracted the work to other companies. Obviously, this is uh, a practice that seems highly uh, illogical and uh, inefficient, and uh, I have made sure that the uh, Clerk of the Privy Council is looking into procurement practices to make sure uh, that we're getting value for money and that we're doing things in a smart and logical way. 
Arrive Can was created to screen incoming travelers and track their vaccination status and was fraught with glitches. According to documents seen by Global News, an Ottawa IT firm, GC Strategies, was hired by the government for the project. It contracted out the work to six other companies and employees were paid a daily rate of $1,200 or more. GC Strategies confirmed it billed the federal government $9 million over two years. Early estimates put the cost of the Arrive Can app at $80,000, but that soared to over $54 million in the end. Alberta's Justice Ministry says it has found no evidence of email contact between staff in the Office of Alberta's Premier and the Alberta Crown Prosecution Service. In a statement, the Justice Ministry says it has undertaken what it calls a comprehensive review of emails sent over a four-month period. CBC News reported last week a Premier's office staffer sent a series of emails to Crown prosecutors challenging their assessment and direction on court cases connected to last year's Coots border blockade and protests. CBC News says it has not seen the email. The Justice Ministry says no further review will be conducted unless more evidence is brought forward. In Washington, four more members of the Oath Keepers have been found guilty of seditious conspiracy for their involvement in the 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. The members of the far-right militia group were accused of trying to keep former President Donald Trump in power after his defeat. In November, a separate jury convicted the group's leader in connection with the attack, which delayed the certification of President Joe Biden's victory. In California, the 72-year-old suspect in a weekend mass shooting has been found dead, and a young man is being hailed as a hero for disarming him. An 11th person has now died after that gunman opened fire inside a dance studio in Monterey Park near Los Angeles. Tonight, survivors are recounting the horror that unfolded and how one man wrestled the gun away from the suspect when he turned up at a second dance studio. Jackson Prosco reports. These are the moments that may have prevented a second massacre. My first thoughts was, I was going to die here. This was it. Security video obtained by ABC News shows bystander Brandon Say wrestling with a gunman just minutes after a mass shooting at a nearby dance studio. Something came over me. I, I realized I needed to get the weapon away from him. I needed to take this weapon, disarm him, or else everybody would have died. It was at that first location where a night of celebration turned to horror late Saturday. Suddenly heard the boom, 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 boom. Hattie Peng was inside the Lunar New Year party when shots rang out. You will see the body already, several lying there. After the first shooting, it's believed the gunman traveled to the second location, where he was beaten back and ultimately fled. The suspect, 72-year-old Hu Can Tran, was later found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was reportedly a one-time regular at the dance studio where he met his ex-wife. A motive remains unclear. In the aftermath, one of the largest Asian communities in the U.S. is reeling as people search for missing friends and loved ones. I tried to reach them. I didn't get any answers. The senselessness of it all has shaken a community already on edge from a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. I feel this sense of great loss about the home that I always had. It's just, it's just gone. I'll never be able to feel safe here again. In a nation where there are more guns than people, a sense of exasperation and exhaustion has quickly set in. Why do we have so many guns in this country and even more on the horizon? It's not right. Other countries don't operate this way and we should not either. But in Monterey Park, this is not just another mass shooting. It is an unspeakable tragedy that has shattered a community. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. In Ukraine, more emergency power cuts were ordered today because Russian strikes have damaged the power grid. And the EU has agreed to another $726 million in military aid. EU foreign ministers approved the package along with another $60 million for non-lethal equipment. They were meeting in Brussels after the West failed last week to agree on sending German-made Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. President Zelensky says a supply of Western battle tanks is badly needed. Germany now says it will not stand in the way if Poland Poland decides to send them. New turbulence for Sun Wing customers coming up. The latest provinces facing cancelled flights.
There is more turmoil in the Canadian airline industry. This time, Sunwing is cancelling winter getaway flights from the Maritimes to southern destinations. Ross Lord explains why and who is affected. Even since pandemic restrictions were lifted, finding a steady rhythm in the Canadian airline industry is impossible. For example, the Toronto-based airline Sunwing, widely condemned for leaving passengers stranded for days over the Christmas holidays, Sunwing is now scaling back. Earlier this month, it cancelled flights south from Regina, Saskatoon and from Winnipeg. Now it's scrapping weekly flights from Halifax to Orlando, Florida and to Cayo Largo del Sur, Cuba. Flights from Moncton and Fredericton, New Brunswick are also being reduced or cancelled. Yes. Among those left in the lurch are Lindsay May and her fiancé. They've been thwarted for a second time in their plan to fly Sunwing from Regina to Mexico for their wedding. Why did you let us rebook and then take back that promise? It's just become totally absurd at this point. Sunwing's recent woes started with a plan to bring in pilots from Europe. We had a certain amount of assurances from our, our legal team that this should be a successful application, and we proceeded down that road. When the federal government rejected the foreign pilots, Sunwing was stuck. They're trying to figure out, okay, what should this airline look like, given the fact we've got 64 fewer pilots than we had originally planned. And that's what you're seeing with these cancellations. John Graddock suggests the winner could be WestJet, which is planning a takeover. I would suggest to say that the value of the Sunwing brand has been affected by their actions over the last month. Passenger advocates say airlines would be more responsible if the government regulator doled out stiffer penalties. In the few cases where airlines were fined at all for breaking the law, it was something like $200 per passenger. It is not even a slap on the wrist. It's more like a mosquito bite. Transport Minister Omar Al-Gabra says it's up to Sunwing how it manages its schedule as long as it compensates passengers properly. Although some customers say they're still waiting for compensation from their holiday ordeal. Ross Lord, Global News. Mass layoffs in the tech sector ahead, why a once booming sector is shrinking its workforce. We are only weeks into 2023, and it's already been a grim start for workers in the tech sector. Some of the world's biggest tech giants have laid off tens of thousands of employees. It is a continuation of a trend from the end of last year. And Gaviola explains why it's happening and what you can do if you get a pink slip. COVID-19 lockdowns in 2020 meant big business for big tech. The increase in remote work for many, plus more screen time, drove a boom in e-commerce spending. But those days are over. Companies are realizing that, hey, we actually want to cut our costs and take care of our shareholders. Um, and they're pretty much sacrificing the uh, employees to do that. Tech saw more job cuts than any other industry last year. Layoffs increased 650% compared with 2021. That is according to a top U.S. consulting firm. And already 2023 is seeing a steady stream of mass layoffs too. If you're part of a union, it should be your first connection after getting the news. If you're not unionized, don't sign anything. Keep all documents showing how long you've been employed and under what circumstances. Then contact an employment lawyer who can make sure you're getting what you deserve financially. Severance offers are typically going to be low. Uh, a company is going to be banking on enough people accepting low severance offers. Um, to offset the amount that they're going to have to pay for those who actually pursue their severance packages. I know a lot of people are going through a tough time, but um, you have to start thinking about negotiating your severance pay. Toby Oluwole was laid off from his tech job in 2017, and he wants people who find themselves suddenly unemployed to know this. It's not your fault. He's now helping people negotiate higher salaries. Go back to the drawing board and start with what fuels me. What actually made me passionate in the first place? This is a great time for career transitions. 2022 was a job seekers market, but even though the tides are turning in 2023, there remains a shortage of skilled tech workers, meaning many can likely find employment elsewhere. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Canadian golf's greatest next, how Brooke Henderson etched her name in the record books.
Brooke Henderson has made Canadian golf history. The 25-year-old from Ontario claimed her 13th LPGA Tour title yesterday, the most professional wins of any Canadian golfer. It was a dream start to the 2023 Tour season, and as Eric Sorensen reports, the elite golfer has her eye on even more prizes. A Brooke Henderson drive. It may be the best part of her golf game. Long shots that have made her a top 10 player in the world. But as a new golf season kicks off, Henderson displayed a putting prowess this weekend that helped her pull ahead of the world's best players and never look back. She's a very powerful player. Uh, tee to green, she's as good as anybody in the world. And when her putting is is uh, as good as it was last week, she's very difficult to beat. As Henderson tapped in on 18, she was congratulated as always by her sister Brittany, who's her caddy, and the usual throng of Canadian fans who form Brooks Brigade at almost every tour stop. All the fans that come out, and a lot of Canadians out here too, so it's just an incredible week and a great way to start the new year. It may seem old hat for Henderson, who wins on tour almost every year, but it's an astonishing achievement. It is Henderson's 13th LPGA Tour victory, each win a new Canadian record, putting more distance between her and the other winningest pro golfers in Canadian history. And Henderson is only 25. Brooke has high expectations of herself, and I think she's, she's a great representative of Canada, and we're just cheering her on, and we hope that she continues to play, uh, to play great and makes everybody in Canada proud. In the off-season, Henderson was forced to overcome back problems, had wisdom teeth taken out, and had to adjust to entirely new clubs, a big change for a golfer. There definitely was a lot of patience involved, uh, especially early on in the off-season, uh, but yeah, a lot of big changes, a lot of things, but you know, I couldn't have worked out any better. Indeed, Brooke Henderson is off to the best start of her career and now leads the points race to be the best female golfer in the world in 2023. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Year Canada is the Winnipeg skyline with a view of the Esplanade Riel across the Red River and the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. We'd love to see you our Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.